Welcome to the Big Movement Podcast. If you're ready to create results and make huge strides in your business, finances, personal development, and health, then you're in the right place. Pushing past excuses and powering through procrastination can be a challenge alone. Here, you'll get the support, tools, and knowledge you need to get to the level you desire in your business and life. Let's get started with your host, Byron Ingram. And welcome to another episode of the Big Movement Podcast. Today, we have a special guest. We have Vanessa Caperera, who is a no BS, straight to the point, social media mentor and email automation obsessor. So she's the one to talk to you about helping you figure out not only which email platform to be using, but also come with the strategy to make sure that it's effective so your stuff doesn't just end up in the spam box with all the pizza coupons and the other <laughs> things that you're going to, that are going to promise to make you rich. So let's learn a little bit here from Vanessa on email marketing. So Vanessa, welcome. <laughs> hey, Byron, how are you? Well, and how are you doing this t wonderful day? Good, good, good. I love that uh, talking about getting in the spam with pizza coupons, and whatnot. That's awesome. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think about it, like you see all these little offers, and they're like, "Of buy one get fifty pizzas free." Okay, I mean, it's a little extreme, but yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> you know the type story. of stuff that's in there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, true story. That's funny. Yeah. You. I mean, it's it's kind of funny when you do look into your spam box and see all the junk that goes in there. You're like, where do people even like come up with this stuff? But yeah, uh, yeah. I make right. sure that my clients don't land in there. You don't want to land in that spam box. That's for sure. Right. Exactly. It's one of those things that people tend to write outrageous subject lines. Like it's going to work. And as, before we really jump in, it's really kind of the you know the irony thing is that you think those different scams you hear out there about like, like I just won this fortune I inherited, you know, from some Nigerian prince or something out there. Yeah. Like, Who falls for this? Yeah. And A lot we... of people, sadly that, you know, you right. won this lottery and we need, you know, your first name, last name, social security bank account and your firstborn. like, and they're like, okay, yeah, it's, it's sad. It's it, and, and scary, but yeah, people fall for it because they're still doing it. You know? Right. And that's scary. Like, you wonder, like, oh, it's that person that falls for it? And then you meet people, and, you you know, they tell you about someone that they know, and you wonder, like, wow, that's wow. scary. I think common sense would have just said, this just doesn't sound right. Yeah, something about this just doesn't feel, go with your gut. Uh, right, exactly. It's like, <laughs> hmm, two plus two does not equal 19 billion <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> right. So now, Vanessa, tell us a little bit about yourself because you have a distinct background that's really led you into the world of email marketing and automation to help people understand how they can leverage it in their business. Yeah. Um, so I have been doing email marketing forever. <laughs> that's actually like my niche and, uh, and like my passion. I could talk about email marketing all day. I'm like an email dork. Like, you know, I look into my personal Yahoo account when I have like 300 emails I get excited because yeah. I'm like, that's like, you know, new calls to action I can look at and new templates and, you know, all this, like these different strategies and how people are getting me to buy. And, you know, so I look at email in a very different way than the world does, <laughs> I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I have been doing email marketing since uh, 2001. And it started when I was a marketing manager for a non for profit association. And back then, um, they were doing their monthly newsletter hard copy, sending in hard copy. And it literally would take us like a week to get it done. Like we would obviously have to put together the content. We would have to print out all the pieces. We would have to stuff the envelopes. And so finally, you know, I was doing some research and I found out about, you know, an email service provider. So I went to my boss and presented it to him. And I wouldn't even call him a boss. He was like more of a mentor who I spill, still speak to today. Um, and he's like, yeah, I love this. He really didn't get it. I was trying to show him, but it was difficult because it was so, so new, right? So he said to, let's go. He goes, why don't you present it to the board um, of directors? So we did at our annual meeting. And I will never forget it, Byron. I literally was standing in front of the board for about an hour, over an hour, trying to make, because there was no phones, you know, there was no, you know, laptops where I can show them, right? I was trying to tell them, and we were going back and forth, battling, and finally, after it seemed like forever, they said, okay, let's try it, but we still want our hard copy newsletter at the same time. I said, fine, done, agreed. So, needless to say, I sent out the first newsletter, and we never went back. To, <laughs> to stuffing those envelopes on a weekly basis. And that's basically where 
it started. And then when I started sending out these emails, what happened was is that a lot of my members started calling and asking me, how are you sending out these emails? What are you using? They look so great. Like, what, what is this? Like, what are you doing? So it was really, really new and exciting for everybody. Um, and as that platform started to progress where, you know, you could see who opened it, you know, all that, my mind just like kind of blew up and was like, holy crap, this is, this is pretty amazing. The information I can get in order to come up with new marketing strategies. So that's where it kind of began for me. Wow. And that's interesting because you, know, you think back to, you know, the early 2000s where some people are like email, oh no, I don't want to use that. And it was that novel item where some people's more curious, like, oh my gosh, I got an email, which is kind of different than a lot of people. It's like, how many did I get overnight? Oh. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's a dramatic shift in terms of how people are receiving the messages today. Yes, for sure. And like I said, it was just such a new platform that, you know, getting an email versus getting a fax Right. It was more exciting. Like there was even a movie. You got mail, you know. <laughs> right. So, so yeah, it was. That's how it started. So it was, it was very exciting. So then, you know, I could tell that, you know, my members, our audience was, they were like looking forward to getting these emails. Oh, I can totally imagine. It. It's you think about that that era. You were excited about getting emailed. Like, oh my gosh, I got an email. This is incredible. You felt special. It was it's right. hilarious to say it, but that's exactly how they felt. They felt like special that they were getting this email. So right. yeah, we, it, we were definitely hitting a nerve and it was, uh, it was exciting. It was an exciting time for me anyways. Again, you know, I'm an email dork, so <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would get enough on that. But yeah, it was, it was new. It was an exciting platform. And, right. you know, again, <clears throat> people think it's old school now. Uh, but not even close. It's still, in my opinion, email is just as relevant today as it was um, all those years back, if not more so. Right. Oh, definitely. It's You look at the world we live in in terms of how people communicate. Email is just a vital component to be able to communicate with people in a timely fashion, to be able to stay in front of them because you look at all the different avenues that are available. You know, if, if you think about it from another perspective, you look at your typical postal mail. Yeah. And how many businesses have really drifted away? Or if you think about, let's say, just your average consumer, how many consumers have opted out of receiving any type of bill or notifications via the postal service. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that comes to them in the mail for the most part are advertisements. Everything of importance to them is via email. It's all digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all digital. Everything's online for sure. And yeah, I mean, I literally just changed my last bill that I was paying manually because they finally, <laughs> it was my water bill, finally set up a way to do it online. So wow. you're absolutely right. I don't get any bills in the mail. It's all completely digital. Right. I mean, I've, it's we just live in that area where if you think about if you're traveling around you know, the world or the country or wherever for a couple of weeks. You know, and in the past, you would have to have your mail forwarded so someone could be looking out for bills and let you know, like, oh, hey, this came in for you, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> really? <laughs> right. Um, you don't worry about like, oh, look, I have the value pack. I got like three of them. in there. <laughs> <laughs> The value pack. Yeah, for sure. So you don't really think about it in the same way anymore because of, of how things shift. And the irony, if you think about it, because in the past, you know, you would check your physical mailbox on a regular basis because, you know, friends would write you a personal letter and so forth. And now you think about how many people that if someone's going to send them something physically in the mail, they have to like tell them, hey, I sent you this so that way they'll know to go look for it. Yeah, that's true. So you have to send them an email or a text right. to let <laughs> right. them know that they're getting something in the mail. Right. Otherwise, like you sent me something. Oh, whoops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, things shift dramatically for sure. And I think also for you know when it comes to email marketing for small business, I think that's where for me like the aha moment came into place because I worked for a non for profit, right? So we didn't have a huge marketing fund, and so email turned out to be like this really cost effective way to be able to reach our audience in such a way that was making like a big, like we can definitely, I could definitely measure our ROI over it. Mm -hmm. And so with that, 
I, you know, you started seeing these small business owners, you know, starting to really go to these seminars and trying to educate themselves on, you know, this whole new email thing. And, and so, you know, like you said, you, you only see really advertisements in our mailbox, um, but you definitely see it in your inbox as well. And I think that's, you know, I'm kind of like the, <clears throat> the rah-rah, the cheerleader for small business. That's actually who I serve. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, in the digital age that we live in social media can be completely overwhelming and just frustrating to a lot of small businesses. For a lot of my clients, you know, they're, they're already doing email marketing. Like, you know, this isn't a new thing. Um, so they're doing their newsletters and they're doing their promotions. And so um, that's what's so exciting is that email marketing is cost effective for the small business owner. And the tools that you have, like, is user-friendly enough where it doesn't seem overwhelming. And, you know, to them, it's, it's something that they can definitely use and then go about their day, right? Because we're all wearing 17 hats at the end of the day trying to run a business. Right. So that's another reason why I'm a fan of email marketing is because <clears throat> it was really, it's effective for the small business owner that can write a promotional email you know, get it out. Hopefully they're checking their analytics, their reports, because that's the most important part to see what's working and what isn't. Um, so that's another, you know, th- thing that I saw after I started using email marketing is I was like, wow, this is really going to help the small business owner tremendously. And it has. Right. So then as that small business owner, you, know, you think about how many people are just getting started in business What's really that key to success to start building it? Because you know, people see someone like, oh, learn how to build a list of 100,000 people and yeah. so forth. <laughs> and someone's struggling going, I, I just want to kind of get somebody other than my mom on my email list. <laughs> so how can people really just get started the right way? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> when I talk to my clients, especially um, clients that I help set up an email marketing program where they don't have one yet, Um, you know, that's the first question. One of the questions I ask during our one-on-one, uh, consulting call is, okay, so where are you? Like, what have you been doing? If you haven't done email marketing, they said, no, it's something I'm interested in. And then my next question is, is, well, how many email addresses do you have in your, in your list? And either they give me a number or, you know, they say nothing. I don't have any. And I'm like, well, that's not true (laughs) (laughs) because we all had to start from somewhere, right? We don't, we didn't just wake up one morning and had, you know, a 20,000, you know, email list. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the same thing that started with us on Facebook, you know, you start by reaching out to the people that, you know, your friends, family, and colleagues, right? So, um, so that's my first advice to anyone just starting out that doesn't have an email marketing program. And they want to eventually do that in the future, get an Excel chart. Actually, I can give it to them, but I have a simple Excel chart that I give to my startups. And I'm like, just start um, a data entering your database, like start building on your database. So then when you are ready to pull the trigger, you have your list already electronically that you can upload, boom, and we're ready to go. We're we're ready to play. We're ready to do some damage. Now, that's a great way to get started. So... For, when someone's getting started in that fashion, what should they be expecting? You know, if they have their connections you know, with just your know, typical personal ones, people on Facebook, what should, let's say, is a realistic goal for someone in the beginning, like after they've canvassed their network of emails? How many should they really have? <clears throat> I don't think there's a set number of, you know, how many emails they should have in their list. Like, look, like you said it, Byron, you know, in this digital age, you know, we're, we're, we all talking about the list and growing your list and you have a big list. This takes time. This doesn't happen overnight. So I really wouldn't even focus on the number at hand. I prefer quality over quantity any day. So as long as you're adding people to your list or people are subscribing to your list who want to get um, your content, who want to get your emails, then you're going to start an email marketing program the right way, the successful way. If you're just adding people just to add people, just so you get to that 1000 mark or 2000 mark or whatever, it's a waste because this person may not want to get what you're, what you're sending out. That's not a real lead to me. That's not a real email value, valuable email in your list. So I wouldn't even focus on a specific number. I would just say, stay consistent and You know, just have in the back of your mind whenever you speak to someone face to face. I know we're in this digital age, but when you're whenever you're speaking to someone face to face, 
at networking events or whatnot and say, you know, I can give you an email, that's somebody else that you can add onto your email list. Um, definitely social media, obviously sign-ups and opt-ins, and we can get out into all that. But as far as the number, when someone's starting out, <clears throat> I don't think they should focus on a specific number. Just think of it as, you know, you started your program, now let's continue to grow it. Right, and when it comes to that, it's you hit it on the head. Quality is better than quantity. You, you look at the number of, let's say, just think about social media with Facebook followers. If people yeah. say, oh my gosh, I have this gargantuan number of people that you know like their page but the reality is you start looking at how many people are actively engaged on a regular basis yeah so it, it that's the real thing it comes down to is like you know someone can have a million people following them but if only 50 people are actively engaging do they really have a million people exactly and you know <clears throat> facebook has changed tremendously you know for the business owner and and how to use it to get your business out there. <clears throat> it still right. works. Like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm still very active on Facebook, but it's completely changed. And so, you know, gone are the days where you have a Facebook business page. You know, let's say you have a thousand people that liked your page that are fans of your, your business. And no longer is every single one of those people seeing every single post that you put out there. It just right. doesn't happen anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> You got to right. pay to play, right? You want more people to see your post. The, the people that are actually following you, if you want them to see your post, you actually have to pay. You got to boost those posts, right? So right. I always say to my clients, I'm like, listen, I'll take an email address over a new Facebook follower any day of the week and twice on Sunday because you don't mm -hmm. own your social media followers. Right. You know this, right? You oh, don't yeah. own any of that. Like, you know, I can like <clears throat> your page um, – today, which I have. I've, I've liked your page, Byron. And, oh, um, well, thank you. <laughs> and I think you have a group also, right? And so, oh, yes. but then, you know, I can follow you for a couple months and then, you know, unfollow your page and you would have right. no idea that I left versus you having me on your list and being consistent with your message. Once you get into that person's inbox, it's a game changer. Right. Oh, totally. Because you own that lead. You don't own your social media followers. Right, exactly. And that's what some p things people don't think about. I, I tell people all the time, you don't build an empire on rented land. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Yes. Because if you think about how many times it happens, like where I've known people that they didn't necessarily follow the rules of Facebook. So, you know, this little public service announcement, if you have not read the terms of service and the advertising guidelines on Facebook, you definitely want to do so because there's nothing like you log on, you realize all your stuff is gone because you broke the rules. Right. Yeah. What happens? Like, I think I have like 2000 or something followers on my, on my, um, Facebook business page, which isn't a monster number, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I prefer, you know, quality over quantity, but mm -hmm. you know, like you said, what if I do screw up something and Facebook shuts down my page? Right. Then what? So since I've been since I've been building my page since I started, one of my objectives was to get the email addresses while I was building my business page. So the majority of the people that liked my page, mm -hmm. I also have their email addresses. Not all of them, because that's pretty difficult to do, but the majority of them. That was part of my objective. Just because I didn't want to be at the mercy, <laughs> and we all are, mm -hmm. of Facebook. Right, exactly. It's become a core component of so many marketing channels about how do you interact with people. It's it's just one of the, the places where we know that on a consistently daily basis, people are going to be looking at Facebook of out of all the different social media channels. Now, granted, you're going to meet that one person here and there that says, I don't use it. And I'm yeah. looking at them thinking... Are you strange or something? Because you're like the only one. Yeah, you're the one, huh? <laughs> yeah, that 1% that just doesn't do everything like everyone else. Yeah, there's that one. Yeah. But just like you said, you have to get the people's email. Otherwise, you know, they could like your page for a little bit and then they disappear. And there's no other way for you to follow up with them. Right. And another thing, you know, when it comes to email versus social media, although I don't like to use that term because really one doesn't live without the other, in my right. opinion. They just go hand in hand. You cannot have a successful social media campaign without a successful email marketing program to back it up. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, the, one of the things is that, you know, people were focused on 
you know, building their Facebook following and that's all that they relied on is that, you know, you have to remember people don't log on to Facebook to be sold to, you know, they don't log on to Nike. So Nike is, you know, saying, oh, this is our our brand new shoe and this is our brand new sock. And here's, you know, you know, a killer, you know, mix that you can download. That's not what Nike does. Okay. So if like you're, you know, all you're posting is your products and services constantly, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose your audience and you're going to lose them quick because no one goes on to Facebook to be sold to. However, right. you sell your products and services. You grow your business on social media. You grow a relationship. They get to know, you know, who you are, your voice, your personality, you know, how you can help them, your, you know, all that stuff. You, you, and you position yourself as the expert, right? But you sell your products and services via email. That's where you sell your stuff. And when you think about it, Whenever someone opts in or joins a list, whether it be, you know, Target or Macy's or Nike or whatever, you know, we're kind of programmed to know, yeah, I'm going to, when, you know, when I get emails from Nike, yeah, I'm going to get, you know, their latest shoe and the sales that they're having and, you know, things like that in their emails. So you build your following on social media, you sell your stuff via email. Right. Oh, definitely. It's... It's all about that engagement that you create with people and it's how you position yourself. It's where people want to look forward to. And the other thing to think about, it's getting people to not, you don't want to necessarily sell to people in that traditional sense. Right. It's getting people to to want to buy. So what is that you're putting out there that makes them hungry? Like, oh my gosh, I've got to have that. Now, like, if you don't buy this, you're missing out. Like, no, I'm not. (laughs) But (laughs) you you look at how much stuff was pushed out and you think, Really? You're going to try to sell that? Yeah. Instead of, whoa, I must have this. Right. You know, because it's, it's all about the value proposition. If there's no value, then what's the purpose behind it? Right. Exactly. And then also, you know, when, when you're sending out your, your emails, right. And they're not all sales emails. You're still educating them in the inbox too, just as much as you're educating them on, on, uh, social media, you're still positioning yourself as the expert. And so, but, you know, when you do go to sell your products and services, it doesn't seem so salesy because number one, if they've already joined your list, they already wanted to get information from you. They're already interested in your company. So you don't have to work. It's not necessarily a cold sale to me um, because you're still providing them with valuable content because you're still trying to educate them. You're not always, you know, selling them. But when the time comes when you are going to sell them on your products or services they're more inclined because they're so used to getting your emails right you know if and if they unsubscribe then okay see you later bye um but the fact is by then you're already you know warm to them and another thing is if they may not be ready to purchase from you or do business with you now but since you're already in their inbox you're already in the back of their mind so let's say i don't know you run a um I don't know, you run a, uh, uh, let me think of what I was just doing. So you run a, <clears throat> a place to a doggy daycare, okay? Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're already in someone's inbox, and then that person gets a dog, right? And then all of a sudden I'm like, what's that, per- what's that uh, oh my gosh, doggy daycare, doggy, you know, bark a lot or whatever. It's always in, right. my, in my mailbox. So you're already in that person's back of their mind. So the more likely that you're going to get their business versus all your other competitors that aren't in their inbox is much higher. So again, right. as long as you're consistent with your messaging, you're already in the inbox. So when they do, when they are ready for your products and services, they'll be like, yeah, let me go back to, you know, bark a lot or whatever. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's all about staying in front of people. Now, of course, we're in the topic about being in the inbox and you know, so many people are using Gmail, they're using you know, different platforms, but one of those things that many of the email providers have implemented are, are filters. So now it's, everything's going straight to a regular inbox. You get things that are filtered into different folders automatically. You have things from, if you look at Gmail, you have a promotional f- folder, you have your updates. So now the, the formatting of the email can determine where it ends up. So how do you typically advise the people with their email so it can be seen by more people instead of just automatically relegate it to the, I'm going to sell you something, a stack of emails. Folder, their promotions folder. Yep. Yeah. When Gmail came out and they divided the, the inbox, 
right mm -hmm. into like priority you know what is it here primary social and promotions yep holy cow that took the email marketing <clears throat> industry by storm we were like what is this and why are they doing this to us right <laughs> like you're killing me so um so you know my best advice and and not only me just like the email marketing industry as a whole together because i belong to like a lot of groups and you know i believe in surrounding myself with smarter people so i'm a, a part of a lot of email marketing professionals and it was a big uproar and that's one of the first things i chose i went to was by my, my linkedin email marketing group and of course we we're all talking about it and trying to figure out what to do so <clears throat> um and you know the idea was simple was to inform your audience educate them so literally there was a lot of emails that were just on how to move your um how to let me rephrase this there were a lot of emails that were created specifically about how to handle this new gmail system because even the people who are using gmail the gmail users were like what what is this right so um, a lot of the companies, what they did is they sent out an email saying, hey, have you noticed a new Gmail, you know, in the subject line? And the open rate skyrocketed because it was new, right? So right. they literally put in there step-by-step -step on how to drag and drop us. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you want to make sure you get my email, this is all you do. And they put images, you know, instructions step-by-step -step on how to drag and drop their emails into um, the primary folder. So they made sure that they would always, you know, receive their emails. So, um, so that's how it kind of handled it when it first happened. Another thing that I suggested to my clients that they do when it comes to like filtering, especially the Gmail filtering is, you know, when it comes to your welcome email, right? <clears throat> that's your first introduction to them, you know, what you could do. And a lot of people in welcome emails, they say they ask them to do something like a little micro commitment, or they ask them to follow them on Facebook or follow them on Instagram or something along those lines, right? Besides just, you know, downloading their, their opt-in. Mm -hmm. So another thing that they could do is, um, hey, to make sure uh, we don't land in your spam folder, make sure to whitelist our email address, okay? So that was like one of their actions. So a recommendation I had put to my, one of my clients is instead of saying that, you know, you can also include that plus saying, hey, if you're a Gmail user, make sure to... Um, drag and drop us into your primary folder as to not miss our future emails. So you're already educating them like as they're joining your list. And if right. you sent out an email already to your primary list um, to educate them. So, I mean, <clears throat> and of course you could post it on social media, but you know, that would be my advice is to get the word out and let them know, you know, how to keep, um, receiving our, our emails within their primary folder. You have to educate them. Right. It's so critical to do that today. Otherwise, it doesn't take long for emails to end up in specific and, and where they don't want it to go. So it just gets relegated to the promotions tab, and then it gets lost amongst the pizza coupons and such. The pizza coupons, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, you just got to, you know, with an email marketing, I always tell my clients, I'm like, you have to tell your readers what you want them to do and how to do it. Right. Okay. Not like in a bossy sense, but like it's just the same with social media. You know, when you post a, post a picture and you're just like, oh, my gosh, is my dog adorable, you know, dressed up in his Halloween costume, whatever. But if you say, oh, my gosh, is my dog adorable, comment and let me know what you guys think. Then you'll start to see the comments floor. You have to tell people what you want them to do and how you want them to do it if you expect them to do it. <laughs> right, exactly. Because if there's any ambiguity, they're just going to sit there and go, um, okay, next. Yeah, okay, Versus great. Versus do this, okay, and then they do it. Exactly, exactly. You, you have to th think of it that no matter how smart people are, when it comes to taking action on social media, because there's so much stimuli, so many different things that people can choose from, you have to prompt people to take a make a specific choice in order for them to do it. Otherwise, they'll make another choice. Yeah, or you'll just be part of the scroll. Yeah, I mean, that's it. If, if you don't tell them what to do, then you, you can't expect them to do it on their own. Right, exactly. So now, obviously, 
in terms of sending out emails for that business owner, they shouldn't be using just like their regular Gmail. Like, okay, I'm going to send out 500 emails from my Gmail account for my business. Oh my so gosh. they need a provider. Yeah. As I'm sure you can have some horror stories. So I'm like, well, I don't know why they shut it down. Like, did you read the rules? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, my hands are sweating as you're telling me that horror story. Yeah. So I've had a couple of <laughs> clients saying, you know, that they wanted to start a, a email marketing program, but they have been doing them and they've been doing them just exactly like you said, like, you know, they put like 50 people in there to, you know, to, um, and they send it out with like attachments and I'm just like, Oh my God, you're killing me. So, um, so yeah. So in order to do uh, email marketing effectively, you have to use, uh, an email service provider and an email service provider is, you know, a, a third party tool that you use to send out these emails. And that could be, um, <clears throat> you know, constant contact, MailChimp, active campaigns. Um, oh my gosh, there's Infusionsoft, Aweber. Like, like you said, there's, there's a, a ton of them out there um, right. to send those out. And the reason you want to use an email service provider is number one, they have their own servers that they use. So the chances of you getting through those filters is a little bit better than just send, sending it from your Gmail. That's number one. Number two, they allow you to create emails that are branded towards your template. So it looks a little bit more professional rather than just coming from, you know, a regular Gmail. So you can brand your business, have your colors, your logos, your social media links, you know, all that good stuff. Um, but the third and most important reason, in my opinion, to use an email service provider is to get the analytics, to get the reports that you need to see how well this email campaign did, how, you know, how did it perform? And, you know, in my opinion, you know, marketing is measuring. If you're not measuring what's working and what isn't working, and that's anything you do in marketing, whether it's email marketing, if social media, a direct mailer, radio, you know, whatever it is, if, as long as you're measuring what's working and what isn't, that's basically what marketing is, you know, right. just, just to keep it simple. I'm a simple type of chick. I think a lot of marketing people tend to make things a little bit more difficult than they are. So just keep it simple. If you're measuring everything that you're doing and something isn't working, then stop doing it and try something else, right? Marketing right. Is, is not guaranteed. It's trial and error. Um, right. So one of the most important aspects of using the email service provider is being able to look at those reports so you can see who opened up your emails. More importantly, who clicked on those emails, right? Because a lot of people go to <clears throat> directly to the open rate and they're like, oh my gosh, let me see how many people opened it. And that's great. That's a very important report to look at. But for me, what I go to first is the click-through rate. Because, you know, you can have 20% of your list open up your emails. And on, that's the average open rate, anywhere between 20 to 23%. I know it's small. But right. if anyone, you know, out there listening, if you guys are having an open rate between 20, 23%, you're doing a good job. Anything over you know, that is great. If you're in your 30%, you're killing it. It's really, really hard, you know, to, to get these people to open your emails. Like the inbox is a battleground, like, you know, make no mistake about it. You are battling for attention. So, um, so the, the analytic that I always run to is the click through rate because you can have, like I said, 20% of your list open up your email, but how do you know that they really read it? Right. Right? How do you really know that they read it? Enter your click-through rates. When someone clicks on a link or, some, or whatever you put your call to action in your email, you, that's a hot lead. That person was interested in what you had to say in that email. That person was interested in your content. And so right. those are the people that you need to focus on is your, is your click-through rate. Um, right. So using an email service provider, those to me, I mean, there's many reasons, but those, those three to me are the main reasons you need to use a third-party email service provider. Right. And you hit upon one of those critical things. It's looking at the click-through rate because at the end of the day, you want to look at the offer that you're putting out there because if no one's clicking on it, it then you can start narrowing down is what you're promoting. Was it relevant to your list? Right. Or what, this is the way that you phrased it. So it, it starts uncovering what you need to do to make something effective because it doesn't do any good if you know you have this massive list and you had let's say 50% open rate you're excited like this is incredible 
and you get one person that actually clicked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Yeah. Right. Wait, uh, something's not right here. Yeah. So the subject line worked. Right. Right. If you got 50% open rate. But yeah, obviously your call to action wasn't quite there yet. So you know that's one thing you'll have to tweak. Right, exactly. But it's it's always looking, what is the end result that you're looking for so you can be able to work backwards? So with all the email service providers out there, how in the world does somebody pick one? Th- yeah. Because it, if you think about, it seems like every month or so, there's a new one popping like, oh, here's this, here's that. And you're like, uh, I just want to click send. So, <laughs> <laughs> how do you decide? Right, yeah. I just want them to look pretty. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I get that question asked a lot, and there are there are a ton of email service providers out there. And my advice would be to do your research. You just you really have to do your research to see um, which one works best for you. Not every business owner is cookie cutter, right? We all need right. different different aspects. So um, depending on where you are in in your business, um, <clears throat> and you know what you're really looking to do and get out of it, um, you would just have to do your research and see which would be your best fit. So for example, you know, Infusionsoft, you know, is like the Mercedes of the email software um, industry, right? So they, they are it. And so if you're just starting off like a small business owner and you're just starting an email marketing program, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that because that's not, that's a little bit too much for what you need right now. So for the small business owner just starting, I would say, you know, look into Constant Contact, look into MailChimp, look into, um, you know, Active Campaign, something, something like that, that where you're just getting started. But really, you just got to do your research, um, ask around, you know, to other small business owners and see what, you know, what they're using and why they like it. So if you're looking just to send out emails and you're looking for something user friendly and not too complicated, um, you know, I would my recommendation if you're just starting would be like a constant contact or, or MailChimp, something easy because that's, that's exactly right. who they target is like the startups. Right. So obviously it's important to have the right message anytime you send out an email and then knowing that you have the right platform. But one of those key components I think that people need to understand more is how do they start building that responsive list so they, they're excited about seeing emails instead of like, eh, whatever. Yeah. Um, I think you need to be consistent. You know, you just have to be consistent with your email. So, you know, within your welcome email, which I hope you have in place, um, when someone joins your list, you should always welcome them. And, you know, within that welcome email, you need to, you know, let them know what they can expect. So if they're going to get an email from you once a month, biweekly, every week, every day, you need to live up to that promise. So then they can expect to get these emails and then your open rates will tend to increase. So you have to live up to your expectations and just be consistent. You know, you can't just send out one or two emails, fall off the face of the earth for four months and be like, oh my gosh, I have to send something out because I haven't sent anything out in four months. Well, that's not a reason. (laughs) Okay. And then when you send it out, you're shocked that you have a 2% open rate. Well, you love them, right? So you just have to be consistent And the second thing I would say is, you know, um, you just really have to know your audience and, you know, what's really working with them, what they're expecting to get from you. So, you know, every once in a while, just kind of test the waters and and ask them, engage them. What are you guys interested in? Are you interested in, you know, um, like for me, I just surveyed my my list a couple months ago and I'm like, okay, guys, what what are you struggling with? And are you struggling with LinkedIn? Are you struggling with email? Um, automation? Are you struggling with growing your list? You know, what is it that you guys want to hear from me and then provide that content to them? Right. You know? Right. Exactly. And that's so critical to understand that, of knowing what is it that they want, because it doesn't make any sense to give your list something that they're not interested in. Because that ultimately defeats the purpose. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's why it's so important to like, you know, position yourself as the expert in your field online, right? And all the social media platforms. So when they do sign up for your list, like let's say, you know, you are an expert in 
I don't know, plumbing, but then all of a sudden you're getting into how to fix cars. You know, your reader is going to be all confused going, what are you talking about? So as long as like, you know, you stick to what you're good at, right, um, you'll attract the right customers. Right, exactly. You have to stick to a theme. No one wants to necessarily learn from the jack of all trades when it comes to things. If you're really good at something, stick with it. You don't have to be everything to everybody because there's this trend out there where people think that if they, they're they not broad enough, they're not going to be relevant, but it's the exact opposite. You want to be known for something because then people seek you out for it. Right. Versus it, like, oh, I do everything. Well, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I do video marketing. You're, no, I don't. Not even. Not even, you know. It's part of social media, but do I do it? No. I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to video marketing or like, you know, how to edit and all that stuff. No, no, that is not me. But email, I know. So, yes, yeah, so it's important to stick to your niche and, and then just ask your audience so you can stay relevant. But I'd say, you know, to be consistent. Right, exactly. It's, it's so important to be consistent. So then when we're looking at all of these things here and we have to narrow it down to just like one thing. What's one thing you recommend people to do today that can dramatically help them with their email marketing? You know, I would say there's a couple of things, but I would say number one is <clears throat> have an objective. Like, what is your objective for sending out this email? And again, like I said before, I've had a couple clients say, well, you know, I need to send out this email because I haven't sent anything out in three months. Okay, that's not a strategy that's like, you know, throwing stuff on the wall and seeing what's going to stick, right? That's right. not a marketing strategy. So I would say, like you just said, go, you know, work backwards. What is the objective of this email? What do I want my readers to know? What do I want my readers to do? Um, so, and then go from that. And then when you go back into your analytics, you're then able to really see, did I meet the objective of this email? Did they register for my event? Did they click on my blog? Did they click on, you know, the last podcast? You know, whatever it is, did they take me up on a coupon? Um, did they pick up the phone and make uh, that appointment? Whatever it is. So I would say, you know, just don't throw these emails together. I have a lot of my clients, like, you know, they just kind of throw these promotions together and throw it out there. Really know what you want to accomplish from this email um, and work backwards from that. And, and then the second thing I would say is, <clears throat> you know, um, Look at those click-through rates. Like those click-through rates don't lie. Those are your hot leads. And so one of the things you could do to better your email marketing today is the next time you send out your email or go if you just sent one out recently, go back, look at your analytics and look at that click-through rate. So let's say um, you sent out an email and someone clicked on a blog post, um, a link within your email that led them to your blog post, okay? So take a look at those people who lick, who clicked on that link. They're interested in that particular topic, okay? So let's say it was about Twitter. I don't know, something along those lines, right? So mm -hmm. what you can do is you can then create a new list within your email marketing service provider of just those people that clicked on that link um, and know that they're specific to Twitter, Okay, and then you can send no, just those people a separate email, maybe offering them a special one-on-one -on -one training or a webinar that you did on Twitter or something along those lines because you know for a fact those people are interested in Twitter. And that's how you really like dig into email marketing and look at your analytics and use it to your advantage. Oh, that's excellent. It's really powerful when you start integrating all of your marketing in that fashion so you can present the offer based on what people look at versus just assuming like, well, they have, they're following me, so they have to like this. Yeah. No, they don't. <laughs> no. Yeah, they have to buy. No, they don't. But right. yeah, that click-through rate, that's those are your hot leads. Always, always pay attention to your click-through rates. Right. That is awesome. Well, I want to thank you for coming on to the Big Movement podcast today. So how can people be able to reach out to you and learn more from you, how they, you can help them with their email marketing? Yeah. So thanks so much for asking, uh, Byron. So I actually have a special for all your listeners. Um, they can go to vanessa-cabrera.com backslash the big movement. And um, I put together the seven essential elements of a great welcome email. 
Um, and a lot of people, you know, when it comes to email automation today, either they don't have anything in place, or they're not welcoming any of their new prospects, which to me, you can, you just might as well virtually shoot me because <laughs> you should welcome any new op to any new person that joins your list immediately. Um, cause that's a new lead, but a lot of people get stuck on like what to say in their welcome emails or, you know, what what to do. So, um, so I actually have the seven essential elements of a great welcome email. It'll help you create your own welcome email. Um, and also what's really important is to, um, it'll have your voice attached to it. I've done a lot of emails for a lot of my clients, but the most important thing is, is that we capture your brand, your voice. So, um, with these, with this quick little guide, you'll be able to create um, a new effective email that will actually have them, um, <clears throat> you know, taking action within doing business with you, not just welcoming them and then forgetting about them. This actually leads them to actually wanting to do business with you. So that is my gift to your readers. Um, it's Vanessa-Cabrera.com, The Big Movement. Oh, awesome. Well, definitely want to thank you for coming on today and sharing your wisdom about email marketing and all that fun stuff that goes along with it. Thanks so much, Brian. I had an absolute blast. This was too much fun. I so enjoyed it. So thank you so much for having me on. Thanks for listening to the Big Movement Podcast today. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Now that you've surely been inspired to take your entrepreneurial career and business to the next level, you can stop by the website and get more. And if you're ready to boost your business brand, be sure to grab your free report, Seven Easy Steps to Build Your Brand Today.